screen. Okay, uh, slides are well visible. Good. Okay, um, so I'll start. Uh, first of all, thank you for having us and thank you for arranging the competition. It was a great experience. So uh, Paul and I, uh, we represented Equinor doing the competition. Um, so I'm a data scientist and Paul is a leading advisor in structural geology. Uh, and we got some help from a petrol expert as well. Um, and uh, we were given two weeks by Equinor, so two weeks to spend on the competition. So that was our timeline. And uh, what we were trying to do uh, was, as you know, fault detection. So I just wanted to like remind the difference between fault detection and fault interpretation. So what we want to do is to highlight where the faults are and give like an overall pattern to help for the interpretation. We don't aim at like, you know, picking it very thoroughly, the whole like the whole fault making planes. That's not the goal. The goal is, is this thing. And also in the description for the competition, it was written that we wanted to see if training on synthetic data could uh, be sufficient to predict on real data. So this is actually a really interesting question because seismic interpretation is quite a big job. So um, you, uh, as uh, Rido just said, we had um, we used only the Equinor provided synthetic data, which is very nice, very clean. The faults are really visible. And then the test data was this Ichi data set. And just from this picture, you can see how different the seismic are. So you can already feel that it can, might be a bit difficult. This is much more noisy. The faults are much harder to see with the naked eye. So we thought there were kind of two ways to get to go at it. Either uh, we try to smooth the real seismic data and make it look more like the synthetic data, or we do it the other way around. Uh, so we chose the latter. So uh, we altered the training data to make it look a bit uh, more real. Um, we went at it two ways. First one is was to filter out some frequencies. So we made one version of the cube that only had frequencies that were under 20 hertz. Another version of the cube that only had frequency under 10 hertz. And then we also made two additional cubes uh, that on which we just added um, normal noise, um, the standard deviation 0 0.1 and 0 0.2. So this was now our training data, the raw um, synthetic seismic and those four additional cubes. Um, then when it comes to the model, we use this FaultSec 3D, uh, which has been developed by Wu and his team in Texas. Um, and we used a pre-trained version. So it's like a simplified unit with um, um, a synthetic seismic and masks. And uh, our pipeline looked like this. So we have all our synthetic training data in SegWi converted into NumPy, and then we split into some small cubes. We have two reasons for doing that. Uh, the big cubes are too uh, computationally intensive. And also, um, whose data set is, whose network is trained on that uh, cubes of that size. So if we want to use the pre-trained version, that's much easier for us to put in the same format. So that's how we trained. Uh, we tried different combination of uh, the data that I showed you before, uh, but I'll go a bit more into details about that later. And then when we uh, went for prediction type testing or for the actual submission, um, we get our seismic uh, cube in SegWi, convert it into NumPy, spit it in cubes, do the prediction on all the individual cubes, and get the predicted mask out, uh, merge it back, and uh, turn it into SegWi again. So that's the format. Um, so this is the very, uh, like this is basically what we did, but we have tried uh, quite a lot of other things. So I'm just gonna go uh, rapidly through. Um, one, the first, one of the first things we try is to add a third channel to our network. So instead of just having the seismic and the mask, we tried also having a third input channel uh, with the variance. Um, so Paul generated all this uh, variance cube uh, for all the data, all the cube that we created. Uh, we modified the code so it would accept a third channel and then we started from training from scratch. Uh, really hopeful about this, but unfortunately, is since uh, we didn't have any variance cube for Wu's data set, we didn't, um, we didn't manage to, we had to train from scratch. Um, 
and then the model didn't actually train. Um, we, we think it's because it was too little data and too complex network. So it, it just didn't go, uh, didn't train. So the results were really disappointing. So that's our finding for the variance queue. Um, then we tried other things. Um, first, uh, Paul did a whole manual interpretation of a part of the queue. So uh, a shallow part uh, where it interpreted all the small cubes, um, all the small faults, and then a deeper part with the bigger faults. Um, but we, uh, there is no good workflow to extract the mask out of Petrel, so this didn't actually uh, go through, even though we are pretty sure it would have really, really helped the network, given us even better results. But you know, when we think back about it, the aim of this competition was to see if we can try if we can predict on real seismic by using synthetic. So maybe this would have been a bit cheating. So in retrospect, happy we didn't get to do that. Um, something else that uh, we tried is to uh, shift the cube. So like uh, as I said, we split it into smaller subcubes. Um, so we created two cubes, basically one that we just uh, start from zero and then split it every 128 inline um, and cross line and depth. Um, and then we also did another one. We started from 64 and then the move from 128. Um, this was because we didn't, um, like some of the faults that were a bit longer that didn't fit in one cube were always cut and we never picked them up, which is very normal. But we hope that this would help us find uh, maybe bigger faults or at least um, have them represented, but it didn't work. And the, the prediction looked much, mess much more messy. So um, we decided to not keep that. Uh, last thing that did work uh, was to split the cube into a shallow and a deeper cube. So we did a cut around minus 3000 years uh, and we used two different sets of training data. So like, you know, maybe the shallow part would have the raw and then one version of the frequency and the noise and the deeper part has another version. This uh, gave us a best like an improvement. Uh, but something that we also realized was that we're never we're never gonna get the bigger faults that are bigger than 128 um, inlines or cross lines because our cube is too small. So a solution for that was to resample the cubes. Unfortunately, we didn't have time to follow that through uh, in the, for the end of the competition, but we really believe that that could have helped. Okay, so after I told you all the things that didn't work, uh, this is our results. Um, so as you can see, <coughs> sorry, our best, uh, so the, the metric we use is IOU, uh, intersection over union, to see how much we predict. Uh, uh, so if you overlay the mask and the prediction, um, you get an idea of how much you did well, because it's so, um, the, the data set is so much uh, biased towards zero because there is much more non fault than faults that this, this metric helps you uh, get a good understanding of how well you're doing uh, for predicting faults. So our best uh, result was 61, uh, which is, or 60.9, um, which I think is pretty good. Um, and this was by using uh, WUS data set, so always the pre-trained model, um, like the 20 hertz uh, synthetic and the noisy data. Okay, so um, this is very much into um, like the technicality and what we tried. Now Paul is going to tell you more about the actual result and the actual seismic result, which is, I guess, the most interesting part. So I'll leave it to you, Paul. Thank you, Marco. Um, yeah, so if, if we look at how this, this was working, um, in some of the early attempts, um, we could see that we were getting predictions of, particularly some of the smaller faults, and we were also seeing quite a lot of false positives where we were seeing little, little faults which aren't really there. Um, and that's when we were training without any noise. Um, we press the next. Uh, but then we then we introduce noise into the training data set and the result i thought was interesting because you actually you you tidy up the interpretation so now it's getting it's 
most of the things it's picking as faults actually are faults. Um, and a lot of the stuff which were false positives, that's disappeared. So it, so the the machine is getting better at distinguishing between noise and 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 non noise. Um, but we see already that there's a, there's a problem here. It's doing quite well on the small faults. This larger fault here, uh, it's not really capturing well. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so. On the last day of the competition, we were given a blind seismic volume. Um, and then these these little yellow patches are the um, the neural nets interpretation. Um, and what you'll see is then, as usual with seismic, in the upper part is has better resolution than the lower part. So the upper part is higher frequency. And in that area, we, we have a lot of small faults. and in fact, it's doing quite a good job of picking up the small faults through this um, shallower part of the section. As you get deeper into the section, you've got lower frequency, you've got much larger faults, and here it's failing to pick up these large large faults. And as Margot explained, this is to do with the size of the volumes which are, are sent to the GPUs. Um, so it's a fundamental limitation of the algorithm at the moment. Um, have the next slide. So yeah, good results in the shallow section, poorer uh, in the deeper section. And here we're looking at a cross line, so we're looking perpendicular. Um, and again, it's picking picking small faults quite well up here in the overburden. Um, and, and this is a 3D method, and we're seeing it's doing a really good job of picking faults which are in strange directions and so on. And it, so some of these ones which look strange, they're probably at a low angle to the section. Um, and again, it's doing doing well here through the through the shallow section, and again, it kind of loses it as we get into the into the deeper section. Uh, and what what we did do is we also we did experiment with also having a slightly different training data set for the deeper and the shallower section. We found we were getting slightly better results uh, in the deeper section when we did that. Um, yeah, the next slide. And here we see um, again in the shallower part of the section, the small faults are being picked picked well throughout here. Uh, this is an area of polygonal faulting where you have a complex network of faults. And you can see again, the yellow is showing that the, the machine is doing a good job of picking the faults. It's pretty well only picking faults, uh, but it is also missing some patches of faults as well. So it's slightly under, under predicting at the moment. Under detecting. And then the next slide again, this is extending a bit deeper down. You see picking this fault really quite well through here um, and it does well where there are good reflect good reflections in this area here where there's less good reflectivity then the fault is not continuous so a human or a trained geologist would would put a fault all the way through there uh, and the um, yeah not just any human a trained geologist would, would probably put a fault all the way through there and that's that seems to be quite hard for the neural net to, to figure out uh, and uh, yeah, go on. So, so some comments on this. Um, we felt that it was quite remarkable that this uh, CNN does so well. Um, it's because it's only been trained on synthetic data. It hasn't had any tuning. It hasn't seen a real data set, um, essentially. Um, it's also very fast. It only took 90 seconds to run. And the entire workflow was less than 10 minutes. And when we compare that with some of the other methods, the, the non Sort of machine learning methods that are out there, it's it's orders of magnitude faster. Um, and the the results for the shallow section uh, with the small faults are good, although it's it's doing some under interpretation and some some loss of continuity. Uh, but already this tool would be useful as a fault detection tool and very much better than some of the the standard tools like coherence and variance which are used in industry. Um, admittedly, the the results of the deep section are poor. Um, we're not able to see large, poorly defined faults. Um, and again, we would need to sample at a larger scale in order to, to really crack that problem. Um, then finally, on, in, on improvements, um, yeah, we think this problem with deep faults can be solved by resampling. Um, the current patches are just too small. Um, uh, we this um, The synthetics, uh, made by Equinor, made by uh, an internal software um, 
called the Compound Earth Simulator, which is very good, and it it would allow us to make all sorts of different kinds of of um, synthetic models, and also have all sorts of different migration algorithms as well. Um, so there's there's a lot that could be done in that area um, for the, to make some really sophisticated training data sets. And then lastly, of course, you, we can also train on human interpretation, and that I think many companies are seeing that that's the way of the future. And and to summarize also, yes, we know that the, out there, there are the, the um, commercial vendors are showing some tremendous results in this area. Uh, they've been working on this for years. We had two weeks, so you can't really compare. Um, but even just with this small exercise, you can see the potential of this technology is enormous. It's, and I, I personally, I'm, I'm convinced it's going to change the way that, that we work. Um, so we have to think quite deeply about how we're going to work in the future. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Paul and uh, Markus. Uh, of course, a uh, really, really nice presentation. Um, I, I'm aligned with you. I mean, it's a bit unfair to put two weeks worth of work against what the vendors are doing, but also the vendors are using a lot better seismic. This is a very difficult seismic database, uh, seismic set, especially the test data with this sort of bizarre noise sprinkled through that seems to throw off a lot of the fault prediction and this sort of very long faults that cross a lot of stratigraphy. Nonetheless, I think that's why I chose it, <laughs> because I didn't want to, you know, we, we've seen enough as an industry. I, I come across a lot of vendors that are showing me a lot of cool stuff all the time. And um, it, you know, it has to work on real data. As it's well. a good test. It's a good test. Yeah, good yeah. test. So, so are there so so I guess ha, have you tried doing any sort of subsampling and and therefore looking at a larger field of inference to pick up the larger faults and then stacking these models or ensembling them or something like that? So that was the plan, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, no. Um, so as as I said, they, they didn't have time within those two weeks. Yeah. But I really, really believe that uh, it's doing really good on this shallow part. So I think this we could keep. But on the deeper part, I think if we were to just just do resampling and then um, like retrain the model there, then I think that would really help. OK. Thanks a lot. Are there any questions from the audience? Uh, I have uh, one or a comment slash question. Um, you compared it to commercial uh, offerings, right? But a lot of the commercial actors are working on these interactive fault interpretation flows where you actually fine tune on the seismic you are going to uh, <laughs> predict on um, by adding human interpretations. What, but what we're doing in this competition is something very different. You're going to blindly get a new cube and then you're going to provide predictions on that. And uh, and I, I think it's truly a different, if, it were, if this was sport, it would be a completely different sport. In a way, <laughs> um, and I want to ask you guys, what do you think? What's your gut feeling? Um, what would it take to sort of take this technology to sort of the holy grail, where you can just take an unseen cube of arbitrary quality and get uh, superhuman interpretations out? Is it a leap in training data, or is it a leap in technology? What's your gut feeling there? I think training data, honestly, labeling, labeling is yeah. it, like it requires such a consistent labeling. And I am not to don't mean to attack any geologists, but um, like the, it, the interpretation is always somehow a bit uh, subjective, and you can't do exactly the same all the time. So I think this is a really crucial part of um, why it's so hard. Mm. And also, I. I think you know that there are wildly different structural styles that occur in the world. So um, to have a single system that will solve everything uh, is probably a, quite a way off. But to have a system that will solve, you know, typical Norwegian continental shelf extensional faulting, um, that's 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 very possible. Hmm. But to solve everything, you're going to need a very very broad uh, training data sets. I think. Well, maybe we'll try again in the future with a much better, much better synthetic data set and, uh, and, and, and try to see. Maybe we can test a few. We'll see. 
All right. Thanks a lot. Uh, for uh, presentation. May I oh, ask you a question? Uh, yes. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation. It was very interesting. Um, so just uh, to have uh, your point of view concerning your um, um, possible improvement using a resampling. Uh, so you used a unit uh, kind of unit resnet approach, and in the unit there, there are some um, uh, steps which consist in uh, doing some max pooling to so to have a kind of a pyramidal. Um, uh, extraction of features from uh, small scales to large scales. Uh, do you do, do you think that uh, this resampling will be much different from those max polling layers in the unit? Um, so I think I think the problem is that some of the faults were bigger than the cube we were making. So like we were literally like splitting them in half, right? So we never get the full information of the fault, like the full fault in one cube. So that's our problem. So uh, when I looked into it, um, it's possible to do it like with the libraries like Segway and just like taking every other inline and every other cross line. Um, so and I think you know then you give that to the model and then it will extract the features based on that. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay.